Hey everybody, this is Brandon McCrillis from Rendition InfoSec. When we're not out hacking the planet, we are listening to the InfoSec Sync podcast with my good friend, Nick Thomas. If you're looking for insight into the vast world of information security, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the InfoSec Sync podcast, the only top rated information security podcast committed to helping you enhance your cyber skill set. Listen in on conversations with world-class information security thought leaders, subject matter experts, authors, and more as we exchange ideas, best practices, and discuss the latest trends, threats, strategies, and solutions for your success. So get ready to get in sync with your host, Nick Thomas. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the InfoSec Sync podcast, where we keep you in sync, with the ever-changing world of information security. I'm your host, Nick Thomas, and in this episode, I will be speaking with a veteran of the United States Navy who is a former network exploitation operator with the Department of Defense and senior technical lead for computer network exploitation operations. But first, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment on your favorite platform so I can continue to bring you InfoSec subject matter experts like today's guest, who happens to be Mr. Brandon McCrillis, CEO and Principal Consultant at Rendition InfoSec. Brandon McCrillis is a cybersecurity professional specializing in network security to include network defense posturing, penetration testing, network design and scaling, security auditing, and offensive cyber operations. He currently serves as CEO and Principal Consultant at Rendition InfoSec. And prior to joining Rendition InfoSec, Brandon was team lead while standing up U.S. Cyber Command's Cyber Mission Forces, drafting technical guidance for computer network exploitation tools, leading cyber operations, and coordinating reporting of foreign computer exploitation capabilities directed against the United States. Brandon is also a SANS instructor teaching the SEC 660 course, which is Advanced Penetration Testing, Exploit Writing, and Ethical Hacking. And without any further ado, here's the interview. Hey, Brandon, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great, Nick. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for uh, taking your time to come on the show. I know you're a very busy guy doing uh, what you do. Just read your bio to uh, the audience. Um, It's pretty intense. So first thing I want to ask is, how in the heck did you come into cybersecurity? How did you get here? What's that story like? Yeah. So I'm rumored to be, uh, I've been called the cybersecurity Steven Seagal. If you remember Steven Seagal in the movie Under Siege, uh, he was just a cook. Just a cook. So I actually started in the Navy as a culinary specialist, mess specialist when I first came in and uh, did that for a while, uh, did the cooking thing and... uh, Basically, um, I fell down on the ship out at sea one time, messed up my knee, and they started talking med discharge. And I said, I have some interesting cybersecurity skills. And uh, two weeks later, they flew me off the ship, uh, sent me to Pensacola over in JCAC, uh, where I graduated with honors. Uh, And then I was stuck in Pensacola. And uh, the detailer said, hey, if you take this test, we can get you out of Pensacola. And I said, that sounds like a great plan. Um, No disrespect to Pensacola, it's just, you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so I took the test and uh, did well at that. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm getting uh, orders over to Fort Meade. Uh, so I uh, went back up to the fort for a little bit. And uh, after that, basically, I graduated uh, one of the top tiers in the interactive operator training. And they said, you can go anywhere in the world you want, except it has to be Texas or Georgia. Uh, and I said, Texas, please. And next thing I know, I'm stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, you know, and, and banging on a keyboard for freedom uh, after that. So that's kind of how I got my start. So what was the initial test that you took that allowed you to go in? Uh, th- so I took the uh, uh, interactive operator uh, assessment, the riot assessment, uh, it's called. And uh, basically, that was an interesting, um, uh, interesting exam and, you know, didn't really know how I would do and and didn't really get much feedback. It was just, you know, here's some orders. Oh, wow. So this was before you went to any, um, uh, CTN a school or after. So, uh, this is after JCAC. Oh, okay. So after, uh, yep. After JCAC, 
Um, and uh, basically, I think we took the test, uh, you know, a month or two, maybe more than that before uh, before we graduated. OK, so for the people that don't know um, about the Navy or, or what that stands for, can you explain to them what JCAC stands for and what you do there? Yeah, definitely. So uh, JCAC is the Joint Cyber Analysis Course. Uh, and for the uh, some officer types, I know enlisted go through it as well. There's also JNAC. Um, which is another uh, another uh, kind of facet of that. But uh, largely, JCAC is a pipeline used for many of the services um, to rapidly train uh, cybersecurity operations uh, into personnel. So that's uh, our CTNA school, or at least it was back then. Yeah, and it's very, very intense. Um, how, how long is it now? Uh, when I went, it was uh, six months, six months of fun, uh, kind of <laughs> going through the going through the ringer. Uh, very military style training. If if uh, anyone's familiar with that, um, you know, uh, drink from a fire hose and then regurgitate uh, onto an exam. So um, <clears throat> you go through that. You take the right course. They send you to uh, good old Fort Meade, Maryland. And yeah. who were you attached to there? And what kind of fun stuff did you do? Yeah. So uh, attached to a student UIC, which was interesting and actually made it so I couldn't uh, couldn't get advanced for a little bit and things like that. Um, but uh, checked in there, kind of got some credentials uh, over in Fort Meade. And then uh, the training portion of Riot was at a facility we used to call Windermere um, out in Annapolis and uh, basically spent my time there uh, kind of. Um, that was, uh, dr if JCAC was drinking from a fire hose, uh, this was getting shoved off the end of a pier and trying to drink the ocean, I think. Very, very cool stuff. So that's where you learn much of your craft, I, I guess. And then you were, you went on to uh, uh, Cyber Command and did some uh, cool mission stuff there. You want to explain a little bit of, of what we can talk about? Yeah, definitely. So uh, remote interactive operator training, uh, Windermere, as it was called, um, you know, got you kind of in the mindset and started that initial path of, you know, what is tradecraft? What is tradecraft in cyber operations? Um, you know, how do we do what we do? How do we leverage our assets to get uh, get information and conduct these? Um, uh, you know, it's... Uh, Largely, it was, you know, theory based, um, you know, very, very, very high speed. Uh, I actually remember, um, you know, I'm, I'm just a cook, right? I'm just a cook. And, uh, and I'm sitting in this JCAT class in our, or the, uh, the riot class in Windermere. And I remember uh, we had a commander come in one day um, and said, you know, not everyone's going to make it. Right. And I think out of 20 students that we started with, I think 12 finally graduated um, at the time. And again, this is back in 2009, 2010. Um, and then you go into the uh, back to the fort and you start on more of the operational stuff. And basically you are uh, doing training operations. You have a certified, uh, you know, either uh, exploiter or uh, another operator uh, that kind of side saddles with you. And you have to go through a check and balance kind of um, audit for a while until, uh, until they finally say, OK, you can operate on your own. Um, and only then uh, do you become a collector. Um, which, uh, again, is, is mostly just uh, kind of getting the information, uh, not so much the exploitation and, um, you know, sustained operations kind of thing. And so you said operator on your own. So before, I guess it was two person integrity to make sure there were no fat fingerings of uh, keys and, you know, <laughs> that sort of yeah, thing. I, yeah, definitely. And, and that's the, the uh, you know, the most fascinating part for me was uh, going to Fort Meade and seeing your colleagues, right? Very, uh, people that you would see in a grocery store or out in public and not have any idea they did what they did. Right. Um, uh, you know, pretty famously, a lot of the operators, uh, remember a, a very nice, uh, older lady who would sit with a little, you know, a, a sweater around her, uh, shoulders because she would be cold on the ops floor and that kind of thing. Uh, and that was the first time, I mean, she was a, uh, very talented lady, right. And, and really taught, a lot of the initial trade craft that I still, you know, use and, and hold near and dear to my heart today. And here you are thinking she was just knitting. <laughs> right. Right. And you're like, this is the senior <laughs> operator that's going to train us. And uh, you would call her ma'am because we're all programmed to call her ma'am. And uh, I remember she'd, uh, uh, you know, she <laughs> she had this don't call me ma'am sign at her desk and, and that kind of thing. That's cool. But uh, yeah. So um, how many uh, years did you do there? And then what did you do? Um, obviously, you're you're out now. 
Um, how many years were you in and then where did you go from there? Yeah. So I finished up my training at, uh, at Fort Meade, um, and started the path toward exploiter, uh, which kind of gets you a little more control of, uh, operations, kind of the more, uh, sexy cyber stuff we'll say, um, for lack of a, lack of better term. Um, and as I said, they're like, Hey, you can go anywhere you want in the world. Um, because I, uh, had graduated out of that uh, assessment portion at the top of the class, uh, except it has to be Texas or Georgia. And I said, please send me to Texas. And, uh, next thing I know, uh, here I am in Georgia. So, um, came down to Georgia at Fort Gordon. Um, and, uh, that was an interesting experience. We, you know, migrated to a new building. We started new operations, really started to, uh, align, um, a lot of, uh, operational things that were happening down here in kind of the Southeast, um, to, you know, big, uh, big mission up north. Um, I was a hard targets uh, operator, so I would be uh, not doing operations that were, you know, kind of quick wins, uh, just a couple days. I would be on operations that are, you know, 18, 24, maybe even longer uh, months. So where other capabilities had failed, uh, where you kind of needed some uh, little little extra push to get into that network or, or to meet that mission objective, uh, that's where I concentrated. Okay. And you obviously... Um got out of the Navy there. Yep. Um, was there a, yeah. a, so it, you know, everyone has a choice to make at, at some time. What, why was it your choice to get out? And can you tell me that story? Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Um, uh, I remember, uh, I remember boot camp. Uh, you know, at Great Lakes, I remember boot camp, and we had this crusty old master chief come in and, uh, you know, asking questions. And this is right before graduating, you get crusty? your Navy bulk out. Sorry, master chief. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> I mean, you know, it depends. I've seen some with less crust and more crust, we'll say. Um, but yes, uh, you know, salty master chief comes in there. He's a, he was a boats and mate, uh, you know, BM, yeah, CM. Yeah, he's crusty uh, and salty. You know, that's crusty and salty. Uh, you know, that's that definitely takes a lot of uh, airtime. Um, but uh, asked him a question. I remember asking a question in boot camp, and I said, uh, "Hey, Master Chief, when do you know when it's time to get out of the Navy?" Um, and he said, "Shipmate, you'll just know." And and that you know carried with me my uh, you know decade in the military. Uh, you know, kind of woke up one day and was like, yeah, "I've done some cool stuff, but I think it's time to move on." And basically, my um, uh, my transition period was was easy. I couldn't have asked any better. I mean, it was really fortunate um, to be to have that training, to have the kind of experience we had, and uh, literally took my uniform off on a Friday, came back in on Monday uh, as a U.S. Air Force civilian. So I did the uh, Department of Air Force civilian on the GG side um, for uh, exactly a year. Um, and uh, started where I was a national asset before working for national type operations. Uh, I then crossed over to U.S. Cyber Command and started working on more military objectives for Cybercom. So were you doing uh, cyber cybersecurity stuff for the Air Force? I was uh, a uh, I was an analyst. So I guess we'll say uh, anyone's kind of familiar with the operator type role. You have operators, which uh, some people analogize to, you know, the one flying the plane. And then you have your... Uh, you know, non-flying officer, we'd call the Navy, the NFO, um, who's more of your backseat navigator. So if you think about cyber operations, you have the person with hands on a keyboard um, that's driving that cyber operation. And then you have the analyst that is saying, hey, look over here. This is what we're targeting, that kind of thing. So um, I was uh, I was rare uh, because I was certified at the journeyman level as an exploiter um, and had completed lots of operations, trained a lot of people. When I went over to the Air Force, they gave me the opportunity to become a R&T analyst, requirements and targeting analyst. And uh, I jumped on that opportunity and became uh, dual certed. So I was a certified exploiter and uh, who could fly the plane, so to speak. And then I was also a certified uh, uh, R&T analyst, so I could plan the operations. And um, they're rumored to have the Macrillus rule still in Georgia um, to kind of not allow those things. But I'll tell you, for a while there, I was uh, in. I was a one uh, a one one person circus show. We'll say, uh, you know, it was planning operations, executing operations. You were a really got a lot to done the, uh, to the enemy, <laughs> yeah. right? They they yes, must have loved it. Definitely. And, you know, operators and analysts, we kind of have this, you know, back and forth all the time. Uh, I'll tell you, I think I had more fun in that analyst position, um, just kind of understanding and seeing the other side of uh, of the stage, so to speak, rather than just flying the plane, right? You got to see all the other components that came into planning and executing those operations. So what hooked you out of the, uh, the Air Force uh, GG lifestyle there? 
Yeah. So, uh, Air Force GG lifestyle. I mean, you can basically uh, go to work every day and, you know, as long as you didn't commit time card fraud, <laughs> you're pretty much good to go. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a good path, right? I was like, okay, uh, I'll just, I'll finish out my time, uh, as a, as a GG civilian. And, um, I liked the Air Force. It was a good time over there. I had a lot of fun in the civilian side. And I was actually sitting at Myrtle beach, South Carolina, 4th of July, watching the fireworks on the beach. And I got a text message from a former colleague of mine that said, hey, uh, this guy, Jake Williams, who we used to work with, uh, started a company and he needs some incident responders to help with a large breach that they're working. And I was like, you know, I have all this leave. I'll just, you know, take a couple weeks of leave and I'll go do that. So I took a couple weeks of leave, uh, went on site to this uh, uh, as a contractor, right, while I'm still a government civilian. Um, Were you double dipping? Uh, you know, it was, it was authorized. It was authorized. I said I could do it. Right. So I could do it. And, uh, so, um, I arrive on site. This is a, uh, $9 billion nonprofit. Uh, don't Google that. You might probably figure out who it is, but, um, it, you know, all good. Uh, and, um, this is my first time really realizing and really seeing the private industry struggles because in the military and the department of defense, in those agencies, you can throw bodies at a problem until that problem goes away, or at least it's covered with so many bodies that you don't recognize it as a problem anymore. Private industry doesn't have that luxury. We have budget deficits. We have uh, skill deficits. We have culture and orthodoxy in some of these uh, organizations. Uh, and really, you know, it, it allowed me to, to really recognize that there is a mission element outside of the military. So I arrive on site uh, and I talk to the incident commander. And the incident commander says, uh, you know, kind of gives me the rundown and says, if you were the attacker in this network, where would you be? And I said, I would be on your voice over IP phones. I would be on your polycom device over there. I see an Avaya call manager that's running Linux 2.6. I'll be on that thing as well. Um, and the incident commander says, we're not looking there. And I said, exactly, <laughs> right? Like, that's why I'll be there. Um, and uh, that was, it was really fascinating. So this, this organization was infiltrated by APT22, so China. And the organization was under the impression that this targeted operation was happening because of intellectual property, because of new drug recipes, new medical technologies, medical research, that kind of thing. And uh, it was really a, a, an eye-opening moment, I'll just say, you know, uh, at a minimum, eye-opening moment, um, when we figured out that this nation-state attack and this nation-state operation was not targeting intellectual property or drug recipes or any of that stuff. They were actually targeting a physician that was working for the organization because said physician was treating a patient in which China was politically opposed with. Um, and, and really, again, it was, it was like, wow, this is really neat. Right. And we, and there's really a need here. So, um, I made the, uh, I made the switch, uh, uh, Jake offered me a job. I came on as employee number three, uh, for rendition infosec. This is back in 2015, uh, and made the switch over to private industry. And, uh, it's been one heck of a ride since. Wow. Well, that, that, that's a really good, uh, story there. Uh, so since you've been on, I know you've seen a lot of stuff, so, um, what are the common mistakes that you constantly see um, customers doing or not doing? Not understanding their environment, you know, misconfigurations, um, uh, you know, bringing it back to basics doesn't quite do it justice. Uh, we still see, you know, a lot of otherwise secure plans or secure uh, programs in organizations just not executed correctly. And I think it really comes down to that PPT stack, right? People process technology. You hear a lot of people talk about this. Um, you have to make sure you have people. You have to make sure they're trained. You have to have those processes. It has to be auditable. You have to be able to um, you know, understand if people are adhering to that policy or not. Um, and then only then do you have all of that worked out that you under, you know, put that technology in place. And uh, unfortunately, what we see is the technology largely comes first, right? We'll see organizations that want the shiniest, uh, you know, coolest firewall that, you know, blocks the negative five days or whatever we're, you know, whatever term Gartner's using this week. Um, and, and you find that it doesn't do the job, right? I get customers all the time that will say something like, what's the most secure firewall? And I say a properly configured one, <laughs> right? Yeah, like exactly. I don't care what firewall, what technology you're using is this properly configured. That's the one I'm going with right. um, versus the one that has all those bells and whistles and threat intelligence and machine learning and everything else um, that still has RDP open to the internet. Right. Um, a little birdie told me about 
your ambulance you guys have. Uh. So can you uh, tell me a little about this uh, hacky hacky thing? Yeah, so um, Hacky McHackface uh, it is our cybersecurity enhancement unit. Um, I'm a product of the 80s, right? Product of the 80s, Ghostbusters, all of that. Uh, when I found a vent- gently used ambulance on <laughs> Craigslist, I had to jump at the opportunity. So we took this uh, gently used ambulance that came from uh, actually Anne Arundel County in Maryland. Uh, only five people passed away in it. So I was like, it's under 10. That's fine. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we decided to strip this thing down, you know, obviously keep the sirens and, and lights and, and all that and uh, paint it hot rod flat black. So, uh, yes, I had to have a very interesting conversation with a paint shop, you know, driving in with this old jalopy of an ambulance uh, and say, hey, paint this thing flat black. Let's decal it up. Uh, And actually, when you start the ambulance up, uh, it uh, has a wireless capture the flag challenge. Um, And uh, slowly over time, we've been adding more features to it. But uh, our hope is to turn it into a fully interactive, uh, you know, cybersecurity learning tool, right? Where we can come on site, we could, uh, you know, respond to incidents, right? Uh, You're not going to roll onto site. You know, some Fortune 100 company roll onto site with your, you know, sirens uh, blaring like your Ecto-1 or something from Ghostbusters. Um, But we use it as a community outreach tool. We use it as a training tool uh, and just uh, an interactive um, uh, interactive demo component of what is cybersecurity and how do you protect information and why does that matter? That's a really good idea that you guys did that. Do you actually go up to clients, uh, roll into your clients with that? Uh, we haven't, you know, I think uh, that would be in bad taste on, <laughs> on some of them. All right. I have had clients um, that we've shown up on site. This actually happened recently. A uh, client showed up on site and they're like, why don't you have the ambulance? <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't know that you would want that <laughs> right? <laughs> sitting in your parking lot um, that says cybersecurity enhancement unit. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, she, she uh, uh, Hacky McHack's face, uh, she hasn't seen any real world action, uh, but it's a great community outreach tool. All right, I just want to pull the thread on something we talked about earlier with with customers and and what you're seeing there. Do you it it sounds like you give them a lot of information when you find stuff wrong. Um do you provide any uh uh CISO services for them, you know, since they don't know um how to configure things or or maybe they don't know how to do a system security plan or or know anything about cybersecurity. Do you guys provide any of that information or any that service? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, being an information security consultancy, it's easy to have this very lengthy menu of all the things that you do. Um, Rendition InfoSec, we try to concentrate on the things that we do well and the things that we do better than anybody else. Um, and those things are uh, our red team uh, type engagements where we're doing, you know, physical, wireless, internal, external, social engineering, kind of the whole nine. Um, and then our digital forensics and incident response. So we take a very business focused approach to our incident response service. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we offer vCISO services. Um, a uh, large portion of our current business is merger and acquisition due diligence assessments. Um, and that's not just focused on a pen tester or a defender. Um, it takes a multifaceted type of personnel uh, that can go into those environments and really assess that risk, not only from, we'll say, board level, but you know, down to the technical, dr- technical ground. Um, So we're always looking for ways to add value to our services. Um, Our approach, um, though we're a private company, right, for profit, um, I want to make sure that every single client we touch, they, we leave and they say, wow, that was an amazing value. Um, we've been known to uh, contact clients, you know, way after the fact and be like, hey, there's a new, there's a new exploit for this technology that we saw in your environment. Um, those kinds of things that, uh, you know, don't, you know, don't necessarily drive revenue, right? It, it's just about building that relationship. That would make with that me client. really happy if you guys came out, did some work, and somehow I get a call from you in six months saying, "Hey, Nick, just want to let you know that so and so that you have, yeah, that's uh, that's not good yeah. stuff. You might want to look into that. That's really yeah, I good." Mean, it's, it- Constantly changing. You have to stay on top. What would you say the number one product or service is that is requested from Rendition Infosec? Ah, that's a good one. Our number one service, uh, I would say, is our digital forensics and incident response. Uh, DFIR um, and and doing incident response right and on a large scale, because we're not just in Georgia, we're not just in the Southeast America. Um, we do incident response all over the world. Um, we've done. Uh, I've I've had to call some of our uh, consultants and say, Hey, how quickly can you get to Belgium? 
Um, how quickly can you get to Mexico City, right? How quickly can you get to Perth um, and uh, and deploy those teams uh, very rapidly? So I would say, you know, our bread and butter is definitely that uh, digital forensics incident response piece um, for organizations that really understand what a red team is, because, you know, a lot of folks will come up and say, hey, I want a red team. And it's a pen test they want, right? right. And, you know, they start scoping things. So uh, customers that really let us um, uh, try to infiltrate uh, that target organization or try to get into their skyscraper or try to get into the bank vault. Um, you know, those are very rewarding for us and, uh, you know, wish we did more of those for sure. Awesome. So one thing, um, people might not know is that you're actually a SANS instructor as well. Um, so yeah, your vast network, right? Because as soon as you become an instructor, you meet people and you've got all the instructors that, that, you know, um, can you, uh, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about, um, uh, the classes you've done or the classes that you're doing now and things like that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, SANS is a great organization. I'm extremely fortunate to be uh, on their faculty as a certified instructor. Um, I kind of fell into it. And, and I know a lot of people, you know, might be listening and being like, what, you know, uh, I kind of fell into it. I never set out to be a SANS instructor. I appreciate every minute of it. It's wonderful. Um, but it was just nothing, you know, it wasn't something that I was really setting out for. Uh, I started, it was a uh, pen test hack fest. I think it was 2017 or 2018. Um, and I was a teacher's assistant and, uh, they just needed someone to cover this class, um, for security 660, which is the advanced pen testing and exploit development class. Um, and I had a blast, right? I'd never, I'd done teaching in the military. I had done, uh, you know, mentorship to, uh, folks, you know, when I was LPO or leading petty officer and things like that. Um, and, uh, really, you know, being able to provide some of that knowledge and, and kind of walk people through tradecraft and, really tie in the wor real world incidents and pen tests we've done uh, is extremely rewarding. So uh, what I do on the sand side is uh, I only teach one class um, and uh, that's by choice. Uh, currently is uh, the advanced uh, pen testing class and it's great. Uh, Steve Sims did a great job of uh, writing a lot of the curriculum along with a bunch of other very talented uh, SANS folks. And, uh, you know, it kind of gets me away from the desk. It kind of gets me out of the office a little bit, um, even though I still remain very technical uh, and I'm still a consultant. Uh, being the CEO of the company, I'll just say some of my days aren't as uh, technically glamorous as I would like. So uh, it really gets me out there. It allows me to share experience um, and uh, really love uh, interfacing with students. Um, other classes I've done is the uh, uh, Forensics 578 Threat Intelligence class. That's another great one um, uh, for, uh, for folks on, on that side. Uh, and I've uh, dabbled uh, in some of the other classes. I used to teach a one-day uh, Forensics 526. So that's the uh, memory analysis class. Um, and uh, did that for the U.S. Uh, Cyber Challenge, Cyber Camps. And basically, it's just a, a one day come on site and try to melt the students' brains. So uh, <laughs> everything from, you know, in-depth memory forensics to uh, writing exploits. And you're probably um, very successful with all that information. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, so it's with, be, with being an, an instructor, I have to ask this question. How do you learn best? Do you learn by books, uh, vlogs, videos? How do I learn best? Um, Podcasts? Uh, I'm, I might be one of the weird ones that learns uh, textually a lot. I mean, I, I like to, I like to, I like to read. I like to practice things. I think um, uh, if 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 the government did anything for me, it taught me to uh, quickly research, know how to research, right? Know how to Google, <laughs> um, uh, ingest information, and then make a. Uh, operational decision based upon that. Um, so, uh, you know, that's really the, you know, the, the big thing for me is, is kind of, you know, the intersection of all of that together, um, I think. Okay. And here's another one for you. What place online would we find you the most? Uh, work professionally or, or just any, any time? Um, I guess any time. Anytime. Uh, Twitter. You'll find me on Twitter a lot. Um, definitely. Definitely like Twitter. Twitter, uh, as everyone Tweeting hopefully knows. Reading. 
Uh, mostly reading. I mean, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say I'm a lurker. I'm a lurker a lot. Uh, we'll just say that, right? I lurk around and, and get information. Um, but I think Twitter, especially on the information security, uh, cybersecurity side, it's just a, a fascinating amount of people there. Really, some some talented folks that are uh, very willing to share information yeah. and and, uh, and and you know increase the collective knowledge of all of us. Yeah. Well, Brandon, um, thanks so much for uh, taking your time out of your day to spend with me to uh, answer all these questions. I'm sure our uh, viewers and listeners are going to love it. And can you uh, let the um, listeners and viewers know how to get in touch with you and how to get to your website? Yeah. So if you're on Twitter, I'm uh, it's so it's supposed to be BMAC, right? And kind of leet speak there, but it's 13M as in Mike 4C. So 13M4C on Twitter, uh, renditioninfosec.com. You can find us there as well. And uh, Rendition's Twitter is renditionsec. Awesome. All right, Brandon, uh, thanks for coming on and thanks for staying in sync with InfoSec Sync. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with me listening or viewing this podcast. Please tell your friends and associates about it and subscribe on your favorite platform. Please send any comments, questions, or requests to me. Nick at InfoSecSync.com. And as always, thanks for staying in sync with InfoSec Sync. That's it for this episode. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. And as always, thanks for staying in sync with InfoSec Sync.